So here's my little EV scope set up on the patio. You've got this lifelong love of astronomy. I imagine you'd had many telescopes over the years. <laughs> You're going to set me straight here. I have. So, no, I've never owned a telescope. When I was a kid, my dad had a really nasty little cheap telescope that we messed around with for a bit. Um, and I've got an old uh, nautical telescope that just sort of lies around the place. But I've never own owned a serious look at the sky kind of telescope until Why now. Why is that? Why is that? Why have you never had one? Um... Partly because, so the times I've actually tried to set up telescopes myself, it turns out I'm pretty hopeless at it. You know, uh, if you go to an observatory, there's a nice big telescope, which somebody really competent has set up and controls and runs for you. If it comes to trying to line up your own telescope and getting all the bits of kit to work, that's not really something I'm particularly good at. Um, so it, it's never really appealed all that much until now. What is the skill you lack? Like, what's the thing about you that made you not good at setting one up? It is this strange thing. So years ago... Uh, I used to run field trips with undergraduates out to the Canary Islands where there was a telescope that we used out there, which is a very basic telescope. And it was very interesting. You could see amongst the students, some of them just had this magic touch that they could just line the telescope up, point it roughly where they wanted it to be, and there would be the object they wanted to look at. Whereas other people could be, you know, really technically competent and try really hard and never get a decent image out of it. And unfortunately, I'm in the latter category. All right. It's just like a, it's just like a knack, is it? Like a magic touch? It, it does. It is. Yeah, it's really is a bit of a touch to it. Um, and it's just not something I'm particularly good at. Why has this changed, Professor? Did you take the plunge because of the sort of the lockdown situation or? No, it was a complete coincidence. So actually, a couple of years ago, I backed a Kickstarter, which is something I'd never done before. Um, but uh, there was this Kickstarter for basically someone was saying we're going to produce a completely idiot proof telescope. And so I figured that was just the thing for me. Um, so I backed it really early. And then it sort of disappeared for a while and I didn't actually think all that much more about it until I got a notification saying, you know, your telescope's being shipped. And conveniently, it arrived just as the lockdown was beginning. So right at the beginning of lockdown, I got a nice telescope to play with. So now you've been doing some lockdown astronomy. I have, yeah. Not exactly from the ideal site in that it's sort of, I can't go any further than my own back garden at the moment, but I can take the telescope out there and stick it in the back garden and point it up at the sky um, and start doing some astronomy. The only slight snag I have here in my back garden is that the patches of sky I can choose are somewhat limited because there are a lot of trees and my wife won't let me chop them down. I know you've got a lot of trees around your house and you live in Nottingham which is you know a big city with lots of light but you can still get the job done can you? Pretty much yeah I mean, it is amazing I mean this whole the whole point of this telescope is that it's actually designed to be used in any environment and so actually what it does is it takes a whole series of really short exposures and just keeps adding them up and some of the test data that they did was, you know, in really brightly lit places where uh, you, you really couldn't see much of the sky at all. And the amazing thing is, if you just keep adding the data, you know, the light from the stars and the galaxies is still there. And eventually you can dig it out from the noise of all the, the city lights. They actually did some tests in Las Vegas, for example, which is not famous for its lack of lighting. Uh, and they were able to see, you know, deep, deep sky objects from a, a parking lot in the middle of Las Vegas. Now, you're going to take us through some of your images that you've imaged from your backyard in Nottingham, which I'm very excited about. The obvious first one to look at is so-called first light. Can you explain the term first light for people who aren't astronomers and what, what that emotes? It, it's it's the mag that magic moment. And, you know, in my case, you know, well, actually, I had a fair while to wait for this telescope, but it is that magic moment where you spent years and years building a telescope or build, building an instrument and you finally get to point it at the sky and see if it actually works. And so the first light image, usually you pick something sort of reasonably dull and straightforward and fairly bright just because you don't want to stress things too much at the outset and you want to find out what the problems might be with, with your setup. Um, but yeah, that first light image, when you first point the telescope at the sky and take a picture and hope you get something. And in this case, I did. What did, what did, what did you choose for first light and why? Okay, so Messier 34, very ordinary open cluster, about a little over a thousand light years away, a hundred million years old. So it's it's not a particularly exciting object. Um, partly I wanted to pick it because it's stars and actually one of the things you want to check with the telescope when you first set it up is whether it's focused or not. So you want to see how sharp point like the individual uh, stars are in it. Really, I picked it because actually this telescope is sufficiently smart that if you just say what's a good object to look at at the moment, it'll tell you. Um, and Messier 34 was what the telescope picked for me. Okay. And you're happy with the picture? It looks pretty good for a first, first attempt, if you ask me. 
It, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's a pretty sharp image. It's, you know, uh, it wasn't quite in focus. I've since figured out how to better how to focus the telescope, but it's a nice, nice picture. You know, lots of stars there, definitely a cluster. And it proves that it is amazing, right? This telescope, you just basically, you take it out, you plonk it down on the ground. The only thing you have to do is make sure it's level. But beyond that, it basically figures everything out. So it, it uses your phone to tell it, you know, where you are in the world. So it knows roughly and what the time is. So it knows all that stuff. But then you just point it in some random direction it takes a picture, it figures out from the pattern of stars as it sees what direction it was pointed in. And at that point, it'll take you anywhere else in the sky. And so part of this was just testing, does that really work? And it turns out it does. You say, go to Messier 34, and you know, 10 seconds later, there it is. Is that taking away some of the pleasure or the skill for you? Like, like, <laughs> or like what's, what's left to, what's your role now? Uh, I get to pick what I want to look at. As I said, it's that you know the stuff that I'm really not very good at is that setting telescopes up, making sure everything's aligned with everything else, finding things in the sky. All that stuff has gone away now, and I just get the pleasure of looking at things in the sky. What have we got next? We've got Comet C2019Y4. This was just something that was sort of timely in that it was a comet that there was an, an announcement that there was this comet had come along that potentially might be quite bright. Subsequently, it's actually turned out to be a bit of a bust in that it's fallen to bits. So it's actually uh, fragmented, fallen apart. There was some hope this might be one of those bright comets you can see with the naked eye. It's now not going to be. Um, but there was quite a lot of interest in it at the time. And it's an interesting target to go after because, of course, comets move relative to all the stars. And so you actually have to find its current coordinates. And instead of telling the telescope to go to a particular object, you actually have to tell it which coordinates to go to. So it was a good check to make sure that the telescope could actually pick up things just on the basis of coordinates. And sure enough, there it was when the telescope swung around to the coordinates that it had at the time. That's not. That's pretty good. Any idea how far away that was at the time you imaged it? Like, are we talking like, I don't, I don't even know where to start. How close was it? It's coming into the inner solar system at the moment. So it, it'll be a matter of, you know, an, a few astronomical units, I would guess. I honestly don't know. Its orbit was going to take it pretty close to the sun, but I don't think it had come that far yet. So I think it sort of broke up on its way in. If I can find out where it was on the night you imaged it, I'll put a little thing on the screen for people at home in retrospect so they'll get an idea. Next on your list here, we have uh, M97, which I can, I can just make out in the image. Yeah, you might need to do a little bit of work on those images to actually get things to a point where you can see them on the video, I guess. It is pretty faint. Um, so it's M97 is this thing called the Owl Nebula, so called because I think maybe it was Herschel was the first to observe it and found and drew this sketch of it, which he sketched as a little owl for some reason. But you can see quite why. It's, sort of, it's this sort of greenish circle with two dark dots or two dark holes in it. Uh, it's a planetary nebula, so it's one of these late stages of a star, a bit like the sun, which is in the process of blowing itself to bits. So it's blown off all its outer layers. So the big sort of round fuzzy thing are the outer layers of the star that have been blown out already. Uh, there's a white dwarf star in the middle. You can maybe see the little bright dot of the white dwarf in the middle. And then the two dark holes are actually where the star is now, instead of just blowing everything out symmetrically, it's actually blowing things out along the poles of the star. So it's evacuated two cavities. So those holes are actually uh, where it's sort of tunnelled through the material that it had previously ejected out. So it's quite a lot of structure going on there. The green colouring, blue-green colouring, is partly down to scattered light from the white dwarf, which is very hot in the middle, partly down to emission from uh, ionised oxygen. It's ionised, so it's very hot, and ionised oxygen produces this sort of characteristic green shade. And then maybe you can see in the very outer parts it turns red. There's a sort of faint red ring around the outside. That's where it's a bit cooler, and you're seeing that characteristic red emission which comes from hydrogen gas. Of course, M97, there's also an excellent deep sky video people can watch. Absolutely, as are quite a few of the things we're going to talk about, I think. The sun will become a planetary nebula. This could be how the sun could lack in five billion years' time. M53. And NGC 5053. Yes, two for the price of one. Two globular clusters actually very close to each other on the sky and actually both at very similar distances away. They're two of the more distant ones in the Milky Way, but they're actually at similar distances and in similar direction. In fact, they're sufficiently close together. They're even interacting with each other a little bit. So there's some tidal interaction between the two that's been detected. Um, so they really are sort of twins in that sense. But the interesting thing about them is I've probably, in one or two of my more careless moments, said when you've seen one globular cluster, you've seen them all. Um, the interesting thing about these two is they're about as different as you can get as globular clusters go. So, I mean, one of them is impressively big and bright and the other is pretty pathetic, really. There are five times as many stars in the brighter one 
Um, but actually, it looks a lot more impressive than even that factor of five because it's very centrally concentrated. So you get this real brightness in the middle. Um, whereas the, the second one is, it is a lot fainter, but it's also much more diffuse, much more spread out. And so it does show that actually even things where glob- globular clusters, where uh, the, everyone sort of thinks they're more, all more or less the same, they really can be very different from each other. You say they're very close on the sky, but you've you've used two different images to image them. They're not so close they'll appear in one image. No, I think they're about a degree or so apart, a couple of degrees apart, and the field of view of the, the telescope is only about half a degree. So you had to move the telescope, but not really not very far. They really are right next to each other in the sky. Just looking at the dates, you imaged these uh, on the same day as well. Yeah, Yeah. so I, once I'd done one, it was no trouble at all to go to the other one. They were right next to each other. And I think I think the exposure times are the same as well, so it really is a kind of a fair comparison between them. Next, we have M51. This is a, this is a real uh, showboat galaxy, this one. Yeah, yeah, M fifty one. Yeah, everyone's favourite galaxy. It's probably it was one of the early things that I looked at just because it's such a pretty galaxy. It's glorious spiral structure, the whirlpool galaxy as it's otherwise known, being stirred by its companion, so the little companion that's sort of tidally stirring things around. Absolutely beautiful galaxy to look at, and I was really pleased when I was able to get a decent picture of it. To the naked eye, is it even a, is anything visible? It's not even a, a speck, is it? It's just there's just nothing to the naked eye. I think it's too faint. Yeah, I think the only galaxy, largest galaxy, a decent distance away you can see with an eye is the Andromeda Galaxy, M31. Um, so this one you really need a telescope to see. That's not a bad image, that one. That's starting to get up around kind of what I would, you know, semi-professional quality <laughs> until, you, until you compare it to a proper professional M51. That's the thing. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased with these pictures, but actually the people who do this stuff properly... And, you know, do the, so the, the telescope I'm using has a little color detector in it. So actually it's, you know, you get your, your whole color picture all in one go. The people who do the job more properly take pictures through different colored filters and then combine them and do use all sorts of fancy software to really extract the maximum from their data. I'm doing the easy thing of just having the telescope bung it all together for me and make a quick color picture. But yeah, I'm pretty chuffed with them. It's funny, isn't it? Even though you've done as little as almost you could possibly humanly have done to have claimed <laughs> to have made the image, you didn't even align the telescope. Uh, there's something about knowing it's your image, isn't there? It really is. It is bizarre, yes. And, you know, all credit to the technology. It did most of the hard work, but I'm still claiming it as mine. <laughs> all right, M63. We've got another galaxy. I image this one just because it's of a nice contrast to M51 in that it is another spiral galaxy. It's really rather a pretty spiral galaxy, but completely different in character in that M51 is one of these things called a grand design spiral. Uh, N63 uh, is what's known as a flocculent spiral galaxy, so-called because it looks sort of woolly. It looks like little tufts of wool. It's clearly sort of completely different in appearance to M51. And so there's been an interesting point of contention in astronomy as to what what it is that causes different types of spiral structure. And it seems likely that this sort of flocculent spiral structure probably has a rather different origin from the grand design that we saw in Messier 51. I'm just looking. Have we done M63 on Deep Sky videos? Yes, it was our most recent one. Yeah. And in fact, you put this image in it. This image is in your video. Yes. (laughs) So yes, yeah. I was just looking. I was looking at the website, saying it's not there, and that's because we've done it so recently. I haven't put it on the website yet. <laughs> so, and in fact, part of the part of the reason I took the picture was because I knew you were making a video, and I thought I might be able to sneak it into the video. The sunflower galaxy, sunflower galaxy, because it looks like those little fine petals you find in a sunflower. Yeah. Next, NGC forty two forty four. So this isn't in the Messier catalogue, but it's in the new general catalogue. Yeah, and you can see it's not as big and impressive and bright as the things in the Messier catalogue, which is why it didn't make it into the Messier catalogue, because they really had to be things that you could find relatively easily, um, or rather Messier or one of his collaborators could find relatively easily. But actually, part of the reason why it's not so big and bright is because it's exactly edge on. It's a beautiful disk galaxy that we're looking at sideways on. And so it doesn't look as, as impressive because you only get that sort of sideways thin view of it. But at some level, it is a very impressive thing to look at because it shows quite how thin spiral galaxies really are, how when you do get to see them edge on, they really are disc-like. Um, so this is a, a sort of some of the first evidence that there was that, as to what the three-dimensional structure of galaxies really was. So the fact that you occasionally saw them this thin meant that they had to be really v- intrinsically very thin disks of stars. Next, we have IC342. What's IC? I, I don't know that one. So IC is the index catalogue. There was the Messier catalogue, 
then there was the new general catalogue came along of a much bigger catalogue of star clusters, nebulae and galaxies. Um, and then uh, as a sort of supplement to the new general catalogue, the NGC, there was this thing called the IC, the index catalogue, which essentially sort of hoovered up a lot of objects that hadn't been found for the NGC. They tend to be smaller and fainter, which is why they weren't in the NGC. And a lot of them were actually only found when photography started coming into astronomy and people could actually, instead of having to observe just with the eye to an eyepiece, could actually take pictures and see things that have been too faint to see before. And so this particular galaxy, for example, wasn't found until the 1890s, um, which is surprising because it's actually, it's a big galaxy. It's a big, bright galaxy intrinsically. It's almost the same size as the full moon. So it would be a big galaxy on the sky, but it's very, very faint. And the reason it's very faint is because it's very close to the plane of the Milky Way. It's only about 10 degrees out of the plane of the Milky Way. And the Milky Way contains all this sooty stuff that absorbs light so that we're sort of viewing it through all this obscuration that's associated with the dust, the sooty material in the plane of the Milky Way. And so only about a quarter of its light actually gets through. We lose three quarters of the light from it, which is why it looks so pathetic and ghost-like in those images. It's also why there's so many stars in the images, because we're very close to the plane of the Milky Way. So we're starting to pick up more and more of the Milky Way stars. And so the reason why it ends up looking so sort of pathetically faint is because we're viewing it through all this fog of the interstellar dust within the Milky Way, which is sort of making it lose most of the light. And so we only see this sort of wraith-like appearance of a galaxy. I think, I mean, my impression, my initial impression, which I, of course, you know, after thinking for a few seconds, I realise is ridiculous, but because it's so faint and because there are so many stars in it, it almost creates this illusion that we're seeing through it and we're seeing stars on the other side of it. But of course, all the stars you see that are individual stars are well and truly in the foreground. Very definitely. Yeah, yeah. And actually, part of the interesting thing is that we're not really seeing through things at all, right? The, the, the reason why things appear so faint is because we're not seeing through the Milky Way. And so although we tend to think of galaxies as transparent, that you can see things behind them, this is telling us that that's not quite the whole story, that actually there is quite a lot of obscuration in a galaxy which prevents you from seeing things behind them. We're almost lucky the Earth is as far flung as it is. The good news is that the dust in the Milky Way is in a pretty thin plane, which means that the number of directions where we end up looking through a lot of it is is not very many, right? Because most directions you could look in, you're kind of looking out through it. And so you're not looking through much of it. You have to be pretty unlucky to be looking right in the plane of the galaxy. So, so it does mean there are lots of directions we could look in, but there are some places where you really can't see very much just because the obscuration is that, that intense. Mike, that obscuring dust that is, sits along the plane of the Milky Way how far out does it reach from the center? Like, are we in it? Are we sitting in that dust or does it get more diffuse out as you get further out into the disk? So it does get more diffuse. There is still some there. Basically, wherever there are stars, you end up with dust because the, star the dust comes from stars. Some of the late stages of stellar burning are kind of not, they're not smokeless effectively. So they just put out lots of this sooty material. And so actually, wherever there are stars, you'll end up finding dust. So stars are big polluters for all this talk about how clean solar energy is. They really, well, most of their <laughs> lives, they're pretty well behaved. But as I say, in, in some of those later stages where they're sort of throwing off a lot of their outer layers of gas and cooling down a lot, that's where you tend to get dust grains forming. So in those late stages, you end up throwing a lot of dust out into the galaxy. Okay, next we have NGC 4449. Yeah, I took, I mean, this is no one's particular favourite galaxy. I took a picture of it because it's one that I happen to have written a paper about, or at least been one of the authors on a paper about this galaxy. It's a, a splodgy looking galaxy, thing called an irregular galaxy. It's a pretty close cousin to the Large Magellanic Cloud. So those from the Southern Hemisphere are very familiar with the Large Magellanic Cloud as one of the galaxies you can see with the naked eye. It's pretty similar to it in that, like the Large Magellanic Cloud, it has a bar-like structure in it. It's a disk galaxy, but it's very messy. It's not as tidy as the spiral galaxies. It's quite a bit further away, so it's quite a lot harder to see. But the interesting difference between it and the Large Magellanic Cloud is it, that this galaxy is producing an awful lot of stars. It's almost a starburst galaxy. It's producing an intense burst of stars right now, or at least in the, in the recent past. And one of the unanswered questions until a couple of years ago was why? Why is this galaxy producing stars so vigorously? And what we were able to do by taking a really deep image, so this was uh, an 18-hour exposure with a half-metre telescope. So still by astronomical standards, a relatively small telescope, half-metre telescope as a, a smallish telescope, but by looking at this patch of sky 
for 18 hours. We got a very deep image and we're able to see that this galaxy actually has a companion that it's ripped to pieces. So it's clearly had a close encounter with an even smaller galaxy. This is quite a small galaxy to start with, but it's had a close encounter with an even smaller galaxy. And the net effect of that is it ended up um, ripping the other galaxy to pieces, but also triggering a big burst of star formation in this galaxy. What was it like imaging this one, like for old times sake and because of a personal connection and seeing this splodge like all the other ones, but, but having all this extra knowledge about it and this like this relationship that you form under the fire of writing a paper about it. So that was really nice. But actually the other interesting thing and the, the sort of the warm glow I got from looking at this one is that most of the other galaxies I've looked at are very sort of they're the standard galaxies that everyone looks at. Right? And so actually there were lots and lots of images of them. At some level, my images don't really stack up to the beautiful ones that some people end up making. And I don't feel like I'm doing anything. You know, lots of people have trodden that path before. The nice thing about this galaxy is not that many people bother to look at it. And so it's nice to look at a galaxy which is, you know, is, is one of those in one of those little nooks and crannies that most people don't bother to explore in astronomy. Feel like you've got off the beaten track a bit. Yeah, absolutely. And and it, as you said, it's kind of nice to look at a galaxy where I think, I, you know, I know something interesting about this galaxy. And so I do, you do feel that sort of connection to it as well. Yeah. Last but not least, Virgo cluster, M87 and NGC 4550. So, uh, yeah, the, so our nearest sort of brightish cluster of, of galaxies is one which I can just about get to through a gap in the trees. So I had to go at looking at it and it's big enough on the sky. That you, you don't get to see the whole cluster at once, but you can start picking out some of the galaxies from it. And so one of the really famous galaxies in this cluster is Messier 80, 87, M87. It's sort of right near the middle of the cluster. It's a big, bright galaxy. What it's most famous for at the moment is that it's where that image, the first image of a black hole came from. Remember the black hole telescope took an image of it. And actually you can just about see one of the consequences of that black hole in this image. It's quite hard to pick out. Um, but if you look at about sort of two o'clock in that image, there's a sort of little bit of an extension in the light. It's not quite round. And what you're picking out there is a hint of the jet. So there's a jet of material being flung out from that black hole, the immediate vicinity of that black hole, and in a very well collimated way. And so M87 famously has this jet. It's actually quite hard to see. So I was really pleased when even with this little four and a half inch telescope, you could actually start seeing some hints of the jet coming out of the middle of M87. Yeah, it's almost like that's an eyeball and that's where like the front of the eye is or something like it just looks that little bit distorted, doesn't it? You can just see that it's not quite round. There's something going on in that direction. And that really is just a hint of that jet of material getting flung out. And NGC 4550 is also there. You included that. That's another one that I happen to have a little bit of a personal connection to. It doesn't look like a particularly exciting galaxy. It's one of these S0 galaxies. So it's a disk galaxy, but without much by way of spiral structure or anything, it's pretty much edge on. What it's famous for is that in the 1990s, Vera Rubin, uh, took a look at it, studied the light, split the light from this galaxy up into spectra and found by studying the Doppler shifts in the light from that spectra that this galaxy is a bit strange in that it's not rotating either clockwise or anticlockwise. It's actually got half the stars going around one way and half the stars going around the other way. So it's a real oddity. Somehow this galaxy formed with, with the stars going around in this sort of uh, two directions at the same time. And there were lots of ideas and theories about how it might have formed. And there were some people were saying, well, maybe the two disks formed simultaneously. And they do look pretty much identical, certainly from the analysis that Vera Rubin and her collaborators did. They said that they look pretty much the same as each other. The, the bit that we were able to add is that a few years ago, with rather better data, 10, 15 years later, that we could get, we were able to show that actually by studying the light in great detail, the two sets of stars are not the same. One is quite a bit younger than the other. So actually what happened is one disk formed rotating one way, then a whole load of gas fell in rotating the other way and formed another disk of stars going around the other way. So this, uh, this period of backyard astronomy you've been doing, uh, do you think it's been good for you? Like, has it, has it, has it, has it like changed the way you think in any way as a professional astronomer or is it just something you did or like, what are you, what are you taking from it? I'm enjoying it fundamentally, you know, and it's hard enough at the moment to find things to enjoy, right? So it's actually nice to have something new to try out, to play around with, to enjoy doing. So I've enjoyed taking the pictures and thinking about them a bit and talking about them. And, you know, I've been putting them out on Twitter and chatting about them. So it's a, an opportunity for a bit of outreach in astronomy. And it's, just, you know, you're, at some level, it is nice to actually, you know, instead of just 
looking at the pretty pictures that the Hubble Space Telescope's taken. You know, it's nice to look at your own pictures. And then, you know, they're not as good as the Hubble Space Telescope's pictures, but that's okay because I made them. And it's just, you do get a definite sense of satisfaction just making the pictures yourself. Well, you're a good salesman, Mike. I want one of those telescopes now. <laughs> I, bought, I bought a manual one uh, a few years ago and I never saw a single thing through it because I just couldn't line it up or get it to work. And I just put it in storage after a few frustrated nights. So uh, that That's why I'd never bought a telescope like that. I know I would have done exactly the same thing yeah all right well thanks for your time my pleasure i look forward to more pictures i look forward to taking them i'll follow you on twitter to make sure i see them all <laughs> mike the sun can you see your video picture or not because the sun's coming to a point where it's half on your face and half not you got a towel sorry a towel all right let's see what we can do yeah that's the right idea it's too small Yeah. Yeah, if it doesn't fall down on my head halfway through the recording. Yeah. I don't think the sun's going to get into a position which makes it bad again. That's nice. It's a nice soft light now. Very well done. Okay, so let me just set myself back up roughly where I was before. This is lockdown uh, YouTubing, people. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs>